Welcome everyone. We're going to give it a few minutes to let everyone sign on and then we'll get started. Thank you for joining us tonight. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this Halloween Eve for a great talk about medical history and Halloween. My name is Sam Mello. I work at the Museum of Medical History, um, working with their um, events and programs. And I'm very excited um, to have our speaker um, and our curator, Dr. Bob, on the call today. Um, so a couple of things before we get started. Uh, if you have questions throughout the program, go ahead and put them in the Q&A or the chat function. We'll read them at the end um, for our speaker. Um, and if you have any questions about the museum in general, um, go ahead and um, you can, I'm under Sierra Sacramento Valley Medical Society. Feel free to send me a chat message. I can answer any questions about the museum. Um, all right, moving on to, I'm going to introduce um, our curator, Dr. Robert LaPerriere. He has been our curator for the last 22 years, and we are very excited um, to have him here. Welcome, Dr. Bob. Well, thank you. Welcome to everybody. Uh, just a couple of words about the museum. Uh, there's only two medical museums in the entire state of California, and we are the largest and I think the most complete. Uh, 22 years we've been there, and we keep expanding uh, in one way or another. Our recent expansion is a tremendous improvement in our website, uh, thanks to Sam. Uh, and the website now has its own URL, so I think everyone can remember it very easily. It's just museumofmedicalhistory.org, and if you've not visited it, we welcome you to visit it. There's basically hours of things you can do perusing the website. Uh, welcome, uh, we'd welcome you to also to the museum. We are open from nine to four, Tuesday through Friday. Uh, and it's, it's totally free and uh, please spread the word. We love to have more people coming in. Uh, I heard tonight's talk several weeks ago when Dr. Thompson presented it for UCD's internal medicine grand rounds. I'm extremely happy that he was able and willing to share his wonderful presentation with all of us tonight. Dr. Thompson is a professor of medicine at UC Davis Health Medical Center with a joint appointment in internal medicine, infectious diseases, and the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology. He specializes in the care of patients with invasive fungal infections and has research interest in clinical trials, fungal diagnostics, and host immunogenics, genetics. His uh, current research focuses on the development of new antifungal agents, mechanisms of resistance, and molecular causes of adverse side effects. Dr. Thompson has published over 250 papers in peer-reviewed journals and serves in several national and international committees and advisory boards, including the IDSA, a coccidiomycosis study group, 
in the Mycosi study group where he chairs the education committee. Uh, welcome, Dr. Thompson, and greatly appreciate your spending this evening with us. Yeah, it's my, my pleasure to be here. Thanks again for the invitation to talk uh, really about the medical history and Halloween. And, and there's some intersection there that I don't think is often taught and, and I, I think is really of great interest. So this talk was really more a labor of love. It's very different than what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, but, but really was a lot of fun to put together. So I do hope you enjoy it as well. Uh, so I have no relevant financial relationships um, uh, with anything that we're going to talk about today, certainly. And I'm overall uh, really not that interested in Halloween. I do enjoy free candy. So that's really my only uh, conflict of interest per se. So before we go through really the medical aspects of Halloween, it's important to really know how did Halloween come to be? And it's really a confluence of a number of different things. So if you if you really look through the history of that, there was a Celtic pagan holiday called Samhain, which also is known as Summer's End. And that traditionally was between October 31st and November 1st. And it really marked the transition from the end of harvest to this darker half of the year, uh, right? There's less sunlight for, for the, the next uh, sort of six month period. The other thing that's interesting is that the tombs uh, in the Samhain culture were aligned with sunrise on the morning of Samhain. And the barrel mounds were opened at that time. And as a product of that, they thought that the spirits really returned home when these burial mounds were opened. As part of that, so door-to-door -door costume uh, began at that time, and then there was rec recitation in exchange for food. And most of the costumes were particularly uh, disguises to keep them safe from the spirits they felt were returning home during that same time. Also, another practice that's, that's very familiar to us now with Halloween is they made these small little figures or ghosts from hollowed out potatoes and squash. Uh, and that's really where we get pumpkin carving today. The next part of this though, is the Romans had this very similar holiday that was um, really to the goddess of fruit and trees and her name was Pomona. Um, so that it also very similarly marked the end of harvest season and they held this festival specifically to honor Pomona. As part of the festival, though, which also has been adopted and carried forth over time to the, the holiday that we now celebrate is this bobbing for apples. Um, so apple bobbing at that time was very different. It was part of a courtship ritual. And the women would bob for apples named after their specific suitor. And if they were able to get it in one try, they thought the relationship was destined for love. If it took a few tries, the suitor would be interested in the female, but it would be a fairly tumultuous courtship. And if it took more than two times, the, the relationship was just uh, really uh, set up for failure even from the beginning. So that's a little bit of the history uh, in Rome for this holiday. But it, the Romans, of course, moved northward over time. And by AD 43, they had conquered the majority of Celtic territory. And Samhain and Pomona merged into the tr tradition that we now know as Halloween. And then the Christian influence of All Saints Day was also uh, really adopted into that, giving us the Halloween that we uh, now know and love. So the learning objectives today really are to talk through the history and the medical associations with uh, five specific conditions. So Dracula or vampires, mummies, witches, Frankenstein and zombies. And if you're familiar with the show Mythbusters, so they sort of present a hypothetical scenario, they evaluate the evidence, and then they give it sort of a grade at the end, whether it's busted, which means it's not true, plausible, which means it could be true, or confirmed, which means there's enough evidence to really prove that association. And that's kind of the style that we'll go through with this lecture today. So the first of these to talk about really is Count Dracula. So this will be case one. And, and so this is Brand Castle. Transylvania is a real place in Romania. This is uh, known colloquially as Dracula's castle. And it's marketed as that from Bram Stoker's book, but there's really no evidence that Bram Stoker even knew about this castle. And there's only tangential associations to the historical character, Vlad the Impaler, that some people think Dracula was based on. It really just shares in name alone. There's really not a lot of very clear associations between that character and Bram Stoker's character. Um, the, the, the castle in his book actually is a crumbling castle, very different than what you see here with, with Brand Castle, which is really quite a beautiful place uh, in Romania. 
So who is Vlad Dracul, where we hear about this association really based on? So uh, Vlad, his nickname was Vlad the Impaler for reasons you can really guess there. He was born in Transylvania, uh, Romania in 1428 uh, or 1431. The years are not very clear in the record keeping from that, that time period. Um, uh, and he was held hostage uh, really by the Ottoman Empire for majority of his teenage years. And it's thought that this really is one of the reasons that he developed this very odd personality where he uh, was really vindictive against the Ottomans uh, and impaled them, uh, this very brutal approach to conquered enemies. Um, there's a lot of literature that suggests even when the opponents outnumbered his army by vast numbers, they were very afraid of him for uh, being impaled while they were alive if captured. Uh, this was furthered by the fact that he dined amidst dying victims, um, and it was thought that there was even blood around his plate that he just sort of reveled and enjoyed. And the books describing his cruelty really became bestsellers throughout all of Germania or German-speaking countries in the 1400s. And that year is, is pretty uh, interesting that that's coincident with the Gutenberg printing press. So that may have really helped establish the legend of Vlad Dracul. Uh, with the development of the printing press during that time. So to further the myth of Vlad Dracul, there were attempts to exhume his uh, grave late in the 19th century, but his tomb was empty. And that this really, again, further confounded the mystique of Vlad Dracul. And in modern Romania, Dracul actually translates as the devil. Um, so this Central European legend of vampires and, and vampires associated with empty tombs, and it's thought that Bram Stoker probably heard about this, and that's what really spawned the legend of Dracula, which we now know about uh, with one of the classic Halloween characters. This, this inspired this fictional inspiration for, for Bram Stoker's book. But where did this come from? Are there any medical conditions that really seem to be related to vampires um, or to Dracula himself? And so here's one of these, and this is called Porphyria. And porphyria is really a, a number of different conditions that are defects in the way that we make uh, heme or uh, uh, porphyrogens um, th that are a component of, of our blood cells, right? So you can see here in the middle, this is really the pathway to make heme. Uh, it's a number of different enzymatic steps, which I'm not going to go through. And then deficiency or inhibition of these different enzymes leads to these different types of porphyria at right. And some of these are actually fairly common. This one kind of in orange here is porphyria cutanea tarda. We see that in the hospital not unfrequently. It's most common in our patients with hepatitis C and cirrhosis from that. And then there's another, this acute intermittent porphyria uh, associated with abdominal pain. It's really a pretty obscure cause, but much loved by our medical students to discuss on rounds. But the one that's been proposed as related to vampires is this congenital erythropoietic porphyria. And this really causes a buildup of all these different precursors upstream of the enzyme that's inhibited. And th these different um, uh, porphyrogens basically that cause porphyria can be deposited in the teeth. And this condition is known as erythrodontia. And you can see how that looks just like bloody teeth and could easily have been part of this um, mythology of Dracula and vampires. Here's what that looks like under a fluorescent light. You can see the porphyrins present in the bone, clearly glow under fluorescent light, and then um, urine left out in the air will oxidize. You can see that picture on the left looks like bloody urine. And so it's thought that some of these different factors really contributed to this mythology of vampires. So to go a little further in that, and here's a paper that went into this in great detail in JAMA Dermatology, as you can see the figure on the left is really the classic vampire from the early 1920s movies. And then uh, one of our, you know, very unfortunate patients that has congenital erythropoietic porphyria, and they both clearly have sunlight sensitivity, right? With with vampires, it's, it causes uh, skin necrosis, and they clearly don't want to be out in the sun. And our, our patients with congenital erythropoietic porphyria, they get scarring and blistering from sun sensitivity. They both have pale skin. They clearly have protruding teeth. And then this concept of garlic allergy is much discussed in the literature uh, and we'll get into that on the next slide. So as we go through sort of our checklist, is this feasible for this association to really have either inspired uh, the mythology of vampires or not? So they clearly have an aversion to sunlight. 
they have a condition that probably does improve with ingestion of blood. So our patients with porphyria, if they were to take a large heme load with iron, it can kind of slow down that process. Both of these diseases have tooth discoloration. And then congenital erythropoietic porphyria can also have hirsutism or extra hair growth. And there's also this thought that this condition has inspired werewolves over time as well. But the aversion to garlic is probably not true. The amount of garlic you have to ingest to inhibit these different enzymes is just too preposterous to be accurate. Invisibility in a mirror with vampires is clearly not related. Aversion to crucifix would really be um, a great stretch. And sleeping in a coffin, I really no evidence that that has ever been done for our patients with um, erythropoietic porphyria. The other problem with this is porphyria really is multiple disorders and skin disorders are common in all of those, but disfigurement like you saw in that picture is only with the most rare form of the disease. And that's with this congenital erythropoietic porphyria. And there's only been about 200 cases of that disease ever that have been reported in the literature. Um, the gums may recede with that con condition, certainly may have aversion to light given the scarring from porphyria. But aversion to light didn't appear in any of the fictional accounts of vampires until the 19th century. So it's very difficult to build a case that these two things are related. And like I mentioned before, this aversion to garlic has really been disproven. You just can't consume enough garlic to inhibit these different enzymes. So what conditions did Vlad, uh, Vlad Dracul have? Did he have any medical conditions? I think it's very clear he was a psychopath, the way he killed people. Um, but one of the very interesting and very recent developments. This was just published in Analytical Chemistry late fall of this year. These investigators obtained three different letters that Vlad Dracul had written during his life, and they pulled off the proteins and the other substances on those letters and did uh, mass spectroscopy, where you look at the protein profile and other substances there. And they actually found a number of components from the skin and respiratory tract that would suggest inflammation. And that wouldn't be that unusual for someone in the 1400s, right? That, you know, with uh, smog or air pollution or just a little bit uh, less hygienic society. But they also found bloody tears. And that's really of great interest in sort of the way we look at Vlad Dracul. There were these reports that there was blood in and around his food often. And if he had bloody tears, that would really make a lot of sense why there would be blood sort of surrounding um, the area where he was eating. And this condition is called hemolacria, so bloody tears. Uh, you can see here a patient that has that. You can see this sort of blood at the bottom of her eye there. And it's caused by a number of different infections. Uh, there's some benign tumors of the eye that can cause this condition, hemolacria. And also nasal tumors can, can, can cause this as well. So, and if you look at the, the paintings of Vlad Dracul, there is sort of a red tint to the bottom of his eyes. And it's, it's still obviously suggested, but not proven, but he probably had hemolacria based on this analysis of his letters. Uh, so I think we can give him certainly one medical condition, but I think it's very hard to say he was the inspiration uh, with porphyria. There's really no association with that. So I think as far as this first case we're going to go through, that myth is essentially busted. Okay, so we'll uh, wrap up. Uh, uh, Dracula and vampires there and move on to case two. And so that's uh, mummies. So ancient Egypt has really long fascinated historians and travelers, particularly this process of mummification. We still today really don't understand the mummification process well. Uh, very limited data is available for, for how this was done. So mummification in ancient Egypt began in the second dynasty, about 2800 BC. And it was really an essential part of ancient Egypt. It was a culturally significant step to the afterlife. Uh, it was also part of a status symbol. And the mechanisms that were involved with mummification still are unknown. And you can see this document that's at the Louvre, uh, the ritual of embalming. So these different documents that we have found are missing multiple pages. So we really can't recreate how the mummification process was carried out. What we do know is that the, the body was dehydrated, it was wrapped in linen, and then different oils from uh, conifer resin and plant extracts were put on the body, but the exact process and which ones they used, I, again, really are unknown. 
And this was really a, a very ritualistic process. The entire point of mummification was to ensure the body remained still while the soul went to afterlife. So this concept that we think about with mummies today was really not part of, of what, what they envisioned, right? So we think about mummies coming out of the tomb and chasing people. Uh, you know, that's very present in, in our kids' Saturday morning cartoons. But that was not in, in the mind at all of the ancient Egyptians as they prepared, you know, their kings or others uh, for burial. So how did this come to be? Where did this come from? So really what spawned this was King Tut's tomb discovery in 1922 by Howard Carter and others. And, and it, at that time, when they found the tomb, there really was a media frenzy because of the intact nature of that tomb. And you can see in the bottom right of this picture, this is the original knot seal on King Tut's tomb. So it's a rope tied in a certain fashion. And then this is clay put over the end so that you can clearly tell if it's been broken open. And that was intact in 1922 when they found King Tut's tomb. So the mystique and intrigue of his tomb immediately led to wide scale speculations. And the entire operation uh, of King Tut's tomb discovery and harder uh, uh, Howard Carter was uh, financed by Lord Carnivon. He was present at the time of initial entry to the tomb, and he actually died early the next year from an infected mosquito bite that he had developed sepsis from. And that started to snowball sort of this, um, the, the curse of King Tut. Um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who gave us Sherlock Holmes, he also further added to this in one of his writings when he said, an evil elemental may have caused Lord Carnivon's fatal illness. So if we look through sort of the initial party that with the discovery of King Tut's tomb and who was present at the time of opening the tomb. So George Gould died in 1923 of chronic pneumonia. Archibald Reed, he died a few days after x-rays of the mummy. James Breasted died from infection. Hugh Evelyn White died by suicide and in his suicide note says I have succumbed to a curse. Richard Bethel was smothered in a men's club in 1929. And the timing of all of these deaths really corresponded with the, the dawn of the golden age of Hollywood. And so Boris Karloff played this first character of the mummy in 1932. And all of this media coverage with Hollywood's interest in mummies are really what spawned the initial fascination uh, with mummies that we have come to know and associate with Halloween today. So some other aspects that have been brought up in the medical literature over the last 50 years or so is what else could have caused these deaths from people who were present at the opening of King Tut's tomb. So you can see this picture here. This is the wall of King Tut's tomb from 2001. And there's all of these little brown spots all over the wall. King Tut was thought to be buried in fairly rapid fashion. So it's thought that the, the paint on the walls may have still been wet. And that would be very conducive to mold growth on the walls. And Lord Carnivon actually had a pre-existing lung condition. So he would have been very prone to uh, a mold infection on top of that. And Carnivon had supposedly become progressively ill after entering the tomb. But that directly conflicts with Carter's diary itself. So there's really no internal consistency that, that opening the tomb caused his infection or death. There are reports that there was a whoosh of air upon unsealing the tomb. And so the, the party there clearly would have been exposed to anything inside that with the change in pressure and sort of the, the, um, the whoosh of air potentially exposing them. And part of this is in 1970, one of the Polish kings, his tomb was opened after 600 years. And in that group, 10 of those 12 people died within a few weeks. Um, and it was thought that that was actually from a fungal spore present in the, the Polish king's tomb. So if you they took that data and they actually went back to King Tut's tomb more recently and they tried to isolate anything they could from the walls of King Tut's tomb, from his sarcophagus, from his mummy. Uh, they have found melanin present, which is suggestive probably of old fungal infections of the or fungal uh, presence of the wall, but no live organisms or intact spores have ever been found. And these brown spots on the wall have not changed in 100 years. So I think it's very unlikely that mold was involved uh, in the exposure of the, the party that opened up his tomb. 
And so this has even been looked at systematically. So this is a study that was in the British Medical Journal in 2002, and they set up a retrospective cohort study. So what that is, is you compare two groups of people. So he compared all Westerners that were present at the opening of, of King Tut's tomb. And he also wanted to see if there was a dose effect. So that would be if they're present for opening the tomb, for breaching one of the inner walls, for opening the sarcophagus and examining the mummy. So the thought would be if there's a curse, the more exposures you had, maybe the earlier you would have died. What he really found was there's no difference in survival. The Westerners 20.8 versus uh, those not exposed 28.9 years. Female sex was actually protective. That was probably a byproduct that they weren't there in high numbers um, and, and certainly wouldn't have been up front. And then Carter took swabs from the sarcophagus. All of the air samples were sterile. You know, if you look back to the, this figure in the middle here of this graph, you can see there's no correlation with exposure to different aspects of the tomb uh, with survival. So that clearly the, the curse is not a cumulative exposure. And then one of the papers very interestingly says, this group died at an average age of 73 plus years, beating the actuarial tables for persons of that period and social class by about a year. The curse of the Pharaoh is a beneficial curse, it seems. And then later in, in sort of the investigation and some of the people that have studied Carter, they saw that he himself probably propagated this rumor of a curse for self-serving purposes, strictly to avoid modern day tomb robbers. So what do we think about this uh, association of mummies with Halloween and any past medical conditions? So the curse I think we can clearly say is busted. There probably was one potential victim of Aspergillus flavus, uh, and that would be a chronic lung infection uh, that may have popped up for someone with pre-existing lung disease. Okay, so let's go on to case number three. So this is Salem, Massachusetts, and I think people will know where this is going now with the Salem witch trials, uh, but this is the house that you can, you can visit there. It's known as the witch house in Salem, Massachusetts. And, and so what about witches? Where did, where did witches come from? How did this come to be? There's really been a long history of fear of witchcraft uh, that's really notable for the opening act of Macbeth, which was published in 1606 AD by Shakespeare, uh, certainly came to attention in the 1500s. And that's really a product that the poor had no access to medical care. And, and since they had no access, they often turned to non-physicians for, for their medical care. And, and these um, non-physicians typically would create these different topical ointments and they would use alkaloids, uh, which is one of the products we get scopolamine now, which is if you've ever taken that for motion sickness, nightshade is, uh, was one of the agents they used. That's where we get atropine that we still use in the hospital today. And then alkaloids like haloperidol, and we give that to patients who are very agitated with schizophrenia or other um, uh, mental health conditions. All of these can be used as part of this routine care for those that had no medical care. And together they were known as the flying ointments because they made patients very confused and they often thought they or others around them were flying. So witchcraft uh, was commonly accused of those practicing medicine without a license, but there are some anecdotes of great success in this uh, practice at the time. So in 1774, um, Dr. William Withering uh, had tried to, to really treat one of his patient's peripheral edema or swelling in the legs and was unsuccessful. But one of the, the so-called witch doctors had given the patient purple foxglove, which is where we get the drug digoxin or digitalis. Uh, and he was really so interested in that, he performed the very first dose-finding study uh, with 163 patients in his clinical trial in the 1700s, and that's how early digoxin was found. So some of this witchcraft, so to speak, is where we received some of our current modern day medicines. The bad part of this though, is certainly there was a witchcraft craze throughout Europe in the 1300s to the 1600s. And the Salem uh, witch trials began just as those in Europe were winding down. So there's a little bit of a paradox there that's really been difficult to explain. In Salem at that time, there were a number of colonial refugees that had fled to Salem Village, and this really caused a lot of conflict and strife between the wealthy group and the more agrarian-focused group that had recently moved there. Um, to compound this, the Puritan villagers thought any type of quarreling was the work of the devil, and then a very rigid and uh, 
said to be greedy minister was ordained at that time. And actually his daughter, three years later at the age of nine, was one of the first uh, people in that location to have fits that later began to be blamed on witchcraft. His niece was age 11 when this, when this began. She also was one of those original three. They screamed and threw things. They had contorted positions and uttered uh, nonsensical sentences. And the physicians trying to take care of these children were quite baffled. And one of them actually said, they are bewitched. So based on that, and then um, really the confession of one of the uh, folks that was probably a forced confession actually began this hunt for witches throughout Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, and at that time, dreams were used as evidence for confessions. And then in 1693, rather abruptly, all of them were pardoned. Uh, over 200 had been accused. 19 people had already been hanged, and they'd even hanged two dogs as part of, the, uh, part of this process. And, and it's been really a subject of much debate since then. There's been several social and medical conditions proposed. And then there's been very few executions for witchcraft previously in Massachusetts. This was not a common accusation at the time. It really had popped up very acutely. And this had prompted a number of different theories. So one of these really is ergotism. And this paper published in Science in 1976 is called The Satan Loosed in Salem. And so what is ergotism? So ergot comes from a fungus called Claviceps purpurea that grows on rye. And you can see in this picture at the top right there, those sort of darker structures, they're called scleratia. Uh, and they contain a number of ergot alkaloids, which would be quite poisonous uh, to those who ingested those. So in the year prior to the Salem witch trials beginning, there was a very damp and warm spring that would really favor ergot infestation. And, and ergot infestation can disappear for several years if the right climatic conditions don't continue. So ingestion of this is very common with rye bread, which would have been a staple for those in Salem, Massachusetts at the time. And then females and children, just based on body weight on average, would be the most commonly affected by ergotism and exposure is cumulative. So the problems with this are ergotism occurs in two types. So there's a convulsive type of ergotism, and that's more of what they, they have really uh, saw and blamed this on for Salem witch trials, the crawling sensations, vertigo, headaches, hallucinations, uh, vomiting. And then there's a gangrenous form that occurs with dry gangrene, uh, which was not seen in the Salem witch trials. So as we try to really examine the evidence for this, the growth conditions for ergot at that time would have particularly favored uh, that for ergot growth in 1691, right before the Salem witch trials began. Localization, so there's some papers, this other in science has really tried to locate where people were affected, and that's been very difficult to put together. There's a causal link for one family, and they seem particularly heavy, heavily afflicted. And uh, at that time, you know, people um, traded in provisions often rather than in currency. So bread could easily have been passed around fairly widely throughout Salem, exposing a number of people who wouldn't normally have been exposed uh, to rye bread. Several people had access to the Putnam's house, which is one of the most heavily affected families. They could have easily had access to any bread or rye that was uh, contaminated with ergot. But there's really some clear dissension for this hypothesis also. And the, the most scientifically based is this first one, and that's this convulsive ergotism really only occurs in those with severe vitamin A deficiency. And it's thought that, you know, a, a city near a fishing source would really not have been uh, deficient in vitamin A at that time. That would have been very uncommon to have occurred. There's also been a proposal that ergot caused serotonin syndrome, and that may have been responsible for these uh, afflicted in, in Salem. And then a number of other toxins have been proposed as well. But unfortunately, I think we just may never know what really caused the Salem witch trials. Uh, but this is certainly one possibility that it was ergot that had contaminated the rye and was widely passed around in Salem at that time. So what do we think about this hypothesis? I think that's certainly plausible, uh, but again, it's unlikely we ever know uh, definitively. Okay, so we'll go on to our fourth case now. So our fourth case is Frankenstein's monster. So uh, I think it's important to remember Frankenstein was the doctor, right? So Frankenstein's monster is what you see pictured here. And the history of this is really pretty interesting. So 
Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was published on New Year's Day in 1818, and she unfortunately had to publish that anonymously at first. And if you think about what was going on culturally in the early 1800s, there was this idea of what is human. That was a frequent debate at the time. It wasn't clear, was that spiritual? Is it biologic? Is it physiologic? In the origin of life, the only thing that was really agreed upon was that, that people needed a vital spark. Uh, and, and on one of these pursuits was electricity. And Shelley's husband, Percy, actually, when he was at Oxford, had tried to revive a dead cat by electricity. So it was sort of in the family before she wrote this book. Percy was in his early 20s, and Mary was 16 when they began their courtship. And their courtship was primarily in a graveyard that was very well known at the time for body snatching. Um, so at that time, there was a very high interest in anatomy and physiology, and the deceased really had no legal rights at the time. And, and due to these anatomical displays in medical school, the bodies were being stolen from graveyards for display. Well, Mary Shelley had had her courtship in one of these graveyards, and actually her mother was buried in this cemetery, and it's thought that likely affected her greatly with this fear of her mother's body being stolen. And so she had this sort of in the back of her mind, and then uh, a few years prior to her book, there was a ghost story competition with Lord Byron, uh, her husband, and uh, John Polidari was also there. And the symbolism from her book is quite extensive. You can see really hints of this fear of bodies being stolen throughout her writing. And the basic plot for the monster actually moves from this initially empathetic uh, monster to more uh, vengeful later in the book. So it's sort of this process of the monster that's also thought a bit of what her thought process might have been with this court shop, uh, courtship in uh, a graveyard with this rather reserved, empathetic uh, time initially to more fearful and vengeful towards the end of this. Well, one of the interesting things about Frankenstein is the Medtronic founder, Earl Bakken, was very fascinated by Frankenstein growing up. And it's said that he watched Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus repeatedly in 1931. And he has this very telling quote, for what intrigued me the most as I sat through the movie again and again, was the creative spark of Dr. Frankenstein's electricity. Though the power of his wildly flashing laboratory apparatus, the doctor restored life to the unliving. And so Earl Bakken went on uh, to develop an electroshock weapon to fend off bullies when he was in grade school. So he certainly had sort of self-preservation in mind initially. But in 1957, he produced the battery powered pacemaker uh, and that is really thought to have been the inspiration for his first uh, attempt at a pacemaker was Frankenstein himself. And Bakken actually has a museum in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Frankenstein is featured heavily throughout the museum. So it's very clear that association and inspiration for Earl Bakken brought us what we now know is the pacemaker. So this myth is probably confirmed. I think that uh, Frankenstein did certainly affect medical history and inspire Earl Bakken for the development of the pacemaker. So uh, really our first confirmed uh, myth here today. And then we'll go on to our last case here, which is zombies and why. Uh, zombies have become very popular and it's always puzzled me a little bit why we have this fascination with zombies. So if you look back the history of zombies, the ancient Greeks feared the undead and there've been a number of graves that have been found uh, where the skeletons were pinned down by rocks and other heavy objects. And then if you look to the Caribbean, which is really where we get more of our Haitian folklore today, they have this history of what are called zombie powders. And these contain tetrodotoxin, which if you remember back from, from high school or college biology, was a, it's a deadly neurotoxin that's found in pufferfish and some other marine species. And they actually found that you can give sublethal doses and that patients then will have zombie-like symptoms, uh, difficulty walking, they'll be confused and have respiratory problems. And this history of zombie powders came really to the attention of the United States with the publication of this book in 1929 called The Magic Island by W.B. Seabrook. And that was really the first zombie story ever. Well, Hollywood picked this up in the 1930s with the first movie called White Zombie, uh, and sadly thereafter, the zombie craze began. And so here's just a number of the films and different television shows that have come out over the last few decades that have gotten a lot of attention, The Walking Dead, 
World War Z, Zombie Land. Um, we even have this uh, movie that we didn't really need called Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Um, so I think that's sort of an unfortunate one. And hopefully that trend won't continue with classic uh, fiction wrapped with zombies. But if you if you think through this, why are we so fascinated by zombies now? So it had actually nothing to do with uh, Michael Jackson's Thriller music video in 1983. So the graph here shows the number of zombie films over time. And you can see there's really no association with Michael Jackson's music video released in 1983. What did spawn the interest in these different zombie apocalyptic movies was 9-11, unfortunately. So post 9-11, the number of zombie films has increased drastically, uh, even about two, uh, three to four fold per year. And that's what came out last year was this television show on HBO called The Last of Us. And our infectious disease fellows were very fascinated with the show. And it really comes from the premise that a particular fungal pathogen that affects insects with climate change began to infect humans as well. So what is the zombie ant? This is a real thing. So this is how this works. As you can see, this, this ant here in the middle and this, these carpenter ants forage across the uh, forest floor and, and they pick up spores at that time and the spores uh, go on to burrow into the, their brain. Uh, and then it causes them to climb up to the top of a tree or a leaf. And then it has what's called the death grip. And you can see this picture here. This is an ant that will not let go of this stem. And while it's uh, clamped down on that, you can see the fungus grows out of the back of the ant's head. Uh, that later makes a fruiting body and releases spores. The spores then fall back to the forest floor and uh, additional ants are infected and that's how it recapitulates its life cycle. So this is a real thing. These are known as zombie ants. The fungus is this, this fungus listed here. It's Ophiocordyceps unilateralis. And that was the, really the premise of the Last of Us television show that this fungus adapted to infecting humans. So can this happen? The short answer is no. But one of the interesting things about that is if you see at the bottom of this graph, just to orient you to this slide, there's over 1.5 million species of fungi. Almost all of those occur only in plants. Uh, plants are at environmental temperature. They don't regulate their own temperature for the most part. But if you go up just a little bit, insects are a little bit warmer. So the number of fungi affecting those is quite a bit fewer. Further up from that is amphibians. And you can see we have a big uh, frog die off globally right now from a fungus called chytrid disease. And then if you go up further, you can see mammalian body temperature is 37. And this mammalian body temperature is really thought to be the thermal barrier for why all these different environmental fungi can't infect people or mammals. Um, there's some really fascinating work that's been done on this by Josh Nozinchuk and Arturo Casadevall. Uh, and they really think this is what led to the rise of mammals uh, at the end of the Cretaceous period rather than a second reptilian age. Uh, reptiles are very dependent on the environment to regulate their temperature, to mount a fever, to fight off these different fungal pathogens, which can't grow at higher body, higher temperature. Uh, but our body temperature of 37 protects us from the vast majority of these fungi. So this insect fungus uh, changing to adapt to a temperature of human body temperature is very, very unlikely. That really don't have a precedent for that uh, at all in any of the fungal kingdom. So what do we know about this thermal resistance to fungi? So you can see here at left, uh, the, the world's warming up. I think that's irrefutable. So global land and ocean temperatures are increasing over time since the 1880s to 2020. You can see that here, we've gone up about 1.5 degrees Celsius over time. But to compound with that, our body temperature is getting colder. And this is primarily seen in first world countries. It's not seen in Pakistan, which was the comparison for this study. And human body temperature is dropping each decade. This was looked at in three different cohorts, and all of those have internal consistency that we're getting colder, men and women both, and both black and white patients were studied in this. All of us are getting colder. So as the world warms and fungi in the environment become more accustomed to warmer temperature, and we're getting colder, that difference in sort of our natural resistance is going to decline over time and, and new fungi are likely going to cause infections for us. And that's been seen for a number of different fungi. So the most prominent is Candida auris, which is in the news a lot of late. 
but also coccidioides, the agent of valley fever, is probably also doing this, and sporothrix in Brazil, which is a fungus you get from plants uh, that are punctured under your skin. Uh, all of those seem to really be a product early of this and may represent just the tip of the iceberg uh, phenomenon. Okay, so let's go back to zombies and talk a little bit about rabies virus. So rabies virus uh, causes a lethal encephalomyelitis, so meningitis for our patients. It's from a genus Lysavirus. And the majority of rabies came from old world bats. The majority of those cases were from Asia and Africa historically. Uh, and the majority of the lineages now are maintained in dogs. And that's really thought to be a product of new world discovery. There's no reports of rabies until the 16th century in the new world. So it's thought that these bat viruses adapted uh, to have a dog host over time. And that's where we get rabies that we think of it today. So again, worldwide, uh, most rabies is in dogs. Uh, in the US, most rabies is in bats. And just to show sort of what does that look like in a patient, um, you can see here this patient has what is known as aerophobia or hydrophobia. So he doesn't like air. And you can see the physician here, when they just blow air across his face, it's very difficult for him to tolerate that. With rabies, you get pharyngeal muscle spasm. So his throat would cl clench up. So when he's exposed to that sort of drafty air is what he's experiencing as he feels his throat sort of close up. And then you can see here the hydrophobia. They'll give him a drink of water here. Um, and same thing, this causes pharyngeal or throat constriction, and he really can't uh, swallow water there at all. And unfortunately, this patient would die. There's only been a handful of rabies patients that have survived across the whole world. And we do see rabies here on occasion. So when we see rabies, we, we biopsy the nape of the neck of our patient. We can see the viral inclusions next to the hair follicle. And we can also tell by serologic or blood testing of patients as well. So a uh, brain infection or central nervous disease really depends on the site of inoculation. So the, the further your bit from your central nervous system, the longer you have as far as receiving a vaccine and immunoglobulin to protect you. The majority of people with rabies in the United States don't recall a bite. And you can see here why that would be the case. Again, most rabies is from bats. You can see these very tiny teeth. That's a very small puncture wound uh, over the, the tip of the finger there. Uh, and wherever they're bit, you can see in our figure here, it takes a long time for it to track up the peripheral nerves and reach the central nervous system. Uh, vaccination prevents lethal rabies. You can also give post-exposure prophylaxis, which is what a vaccine plus immunoglobulin is. And they have found a group of people in the Peruvian Amazon that are seropositive for rabies virus and did not die. So we do see people that have had rabies actually fought it off and done quite well. So very different than what we see here in the West. Um, it again takes, takes a peripheral nerve all the way to the central nervous system. And then it descends through the facial nerve through the salivary glands. Um, and it's really thought that one of the reasons for that is uh, this salivary involvement by the virus is it wants to keep you from drinking water. Um, with water, you're going to dilute the presence of the virus in your saliva and it could decrease its replicative capacity and infectiousness to others. So it's thought that that may be why that evolved other time. So the take home message from that is it's not just in dogs, not just in bats, really avoid wild animals with unusual activity of any kind, lots of different, you know, possums, foxes, raccoons, skunks, certainly a lot of different animals can have rabies. Um, but this association of zombies with any actual medical condition, I think is busted. There's clearly no uh, obvious association with any of these diseases with what we think of as zombieism. But I'll leave you with this. What about a zombie virus? This just came out not too long ago in March. Uh, scientists have revived a zombie virus that has spent almost 50,000 years frozen in permafrost. So that seems to me like a bad idea. Uh, I think it's certainly interesting, but I think we should be careful what we are getting ourselves into. Um, but with that, just thank you so much for joining tonight. Hopefully this was enjoyable and, and educational for you. And I wish you a happy Halloween and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. That was great. That's um wow. I didn't know most of that. That was wonderful. Do we have any questions? Um, go ahead, put your questions in the chat. You covered so much. 
Oh, you're getting lots of thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. That's great. Now we now I'll have to go tell my kids that are all afraid, my six year old, that zombies aren't real, not to worry about it. <laughs> What about California manifesting? I'm sorry, was that one of the questions? Oh, here we go. What might you know about other cures that may have been used for these illnesses? Um, I mean, I think that porphyria would be the, um, to, just to think through these, porphyria, you know, there was this thought that you can give patients heme or iron infusions even 50 years ago um because it, it would decrease the symptoms so i think you know for porphyria that had been one i think that one's probably the one with the closest association to a classic halloween character um uh that that's i mean there, a lot of these different drugs are you know based have a steep history uh and used by so-called witch doctors before the medicinal component was extracted um there's a lot of interest in malaria you know so so artusanate is is we get from uh one of the, it's for a traditional Chinese medicine compound that artusanate was discovered and that's what we treat severe malaria with today. Um, so just a huge host of different diseases um, uh, are treated, you know, have a lot of roots in sort of this um, ancestral type medicine. There were several iron cures, like the pink pills for pale people in the late 1800s. They claim to fix many things. Yeah, that's sort of the unregulated part of the pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. Before there was an industry, right? Before there was an <laughs> FDA, they, they were, you could say whatever you wanted. Right. There was a comment about witches, which I, I'm not sure I understood, though. I'm sorry. Any association with witches? Um, I'll wait and see if they type anything else there. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, <laughs> a lot of people on the internet claim to be able to manifest things. That was is totally true. I try to stay off the web uh, for that reason. <laughs> There's always cures available for every ailment on, on different chat forums and those things. All right. Are there any other questions for Dr. Thompson? Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, absolutely. My, my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation and hope to see you all again. All right. All right. Thank have a good evening. Much. Yep. Take care. Bye bye. Both, both oh, we have one enjoyable. We do have one one more question. Why was iron added to strychnine? See Lily strychnine elixir. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know. I mean, a lot. I mean, iron heavy metals were added a lot of things a long time ago, purposefully or. Uh, not on purpose. So, but I, I don't know specifically for strychnine why. All right, we'll go ahead and sign off for the evening. Thank you so all right. much. Yep. You all have a good night. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Thank you again.